And he came up with this clever experiment where he would young, ask young men two questions. He'd say, what does it mean to be a good man? If you're at a funeral and in the eulogy, somebody says he was a good man. What does that mean? And he said, the sociologist said, all around the world, young men had no trouble answering that. They would immediately say, duty, honor, integrity, sacrifice, do the right thing, be a protector, be a provider, be generous, be responsible. And he'd say, well, where'd you learn that? And the young men would say, I don't know. It's just in the air we breathe. Although if they were in a Western country, they would often say it's our Judeo-Christian heritage. So then he would ask a second question. He would say, well, what does it mean if I say man up, be a real man? And the young men would say, no, 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 that's completely different. They would say that means be tough, be strong, never show weakness, play, f- play through pain, be, be competitive, get rich, get laid. I'm using their language. And the sociologists concluded that men are, in fact, being pressured between these two conflicting scripts. Again, we would say, just like with the other study, men do know what it means to be a good man. I think that, to me, that was incredibly encouraging. Men do have this inherent, innate knowledge. Romans 2, right? We all have a conscience, Paul tells us. So men do have an intrinsic knowledge of what it means to be the good man. But they're feeling social pressure, cultural pressure to be the real man, quote unquote, which can slide into being more toxic. Those are the traits, especially if it's disconnected from the moral ideal of the good man. It can become dominance, entitlement, control, and so on. And so what this does, I I draw two conclusions. One is it gives us a much better way for dealing with these issues. You know, men don't respond well to being called toxic, right? Right? Nobody does. So instead of that, it'd be much more effective if you can tap into their inherent innate knowledge of what it means to be the good man. I'm here today with Professor Piercy, author of The Toxic War on Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes. Professor Piercy, welcome to Brave New Us. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Can you briefly introduce yourself and tell us how you came to be interested in studying masculinity? Yeah, um, I have to tell you, this has been the most controversial book I've written. And one of the first questions people always ask is, whose side is she on? And the second question is, And why is a woman writing a book on masculinity (laughs) anyway? So, you know, I did I I did put in the introduction, I wrote an introduction about the abusive home that I grew up in. My father was severely physically abusive in in books on abuse. They will often ask, was it open hand or closed fist? And with my father, it was closed fist. So I, I, in a sense, the way I put it in the introduction is in a sense, I've been writing this book my whole life Mm -hmm. because I've had to work out you know, a positive biblical view of masculinity. And a psychologist interviewed me a little while ago, and he said, well, at least we know you're not writing from some ivory tower. You're writing from the trenches. You've really been there. So in many ways, that was kind of the, that's the the, the whole life background <laughs> to this book. Yeah. Wow. I, I love the title. Usually we hear about toxic masculinity, but you flipped it. You said that the war on masculinity is what is really toxic. How is masculinity being attacked and what can we do about it? I'm glad you like the title, by the way. I I did want the play on words and, you know, I needed to get the word toxic and the word masculinity in there, but I did not want the phrase toxic masculinity Mm -hmm. because that assumes that I think there is such a thing and I didn't want that. So, so it is another reason I wrote the book, of course, is that I was shocked, to be to be honest, about how socially acceptable it has come to attack masculinity, to express hostility. So, for example, the Washington Post had an article titled, Why Can't We Hate Men? And I thought, really? <laughs> In a respected mainstream publication, a Huffington Post editor tweeted, hashtag, kill all men. You can buy t-shirts that say, so many men, so little ammunition. And you can buy books with titles like, I hate men, no good men, and are men necessary? And even men are jumping on the bandwagon. So a fairly well-known male author wrote, talking about healthy masculinity is like talking about healthy cancer. And you may have seen this one because it was in the news just maybe a few months ago now, but the director of the movie Avatar, James Cameron, in the news saying testosterone is a toxin that you have to work out of your system. So no wonder a few years ago in a survey, almost half of American men agreed with the statement, these days 
seems to punish men just for acting like men. So that's that was kind of the, the turning point, too, of why I wanted to write this book. I wanted to get to the bottom of it. Why has secular culture gotten masculinity so wrong? You know, how has it come to such a negative interpretation? You can't stand against a social trend unless you know where it came from and how it developed. So a big part of the book is just explaining where it even came from so that we can respond more effectively. So do you think there is such a thing as toxic masculinity or how do you explain clearly all this pain in the culture that's lashing out at men and masculinity? Well, I do have several chapters on how the secular script got increasingly toxic. Mm. And, you know, if men are told this is how you are, then that's how they will act. And, but I'll, I'll focus on just one stage because I think it was much more influential than people realize. And, and that's the rise of Darwinian evolution. Darwinian, uh, Darwinian writers, so this would be like late, late 19th century, began to say the men who won out in the struggle for survival would by, be by necessity, would be rugged, ruthless, savage, barbarian, brutal, and even predatory. And they said the way to discover your true masculinity, your authentic self, is to get in touch with the beast within. And so before that, Christianity had urged men to live up to the image of God in them. But now secular society was telling men to live down to their animal nature, their presumed you know, animal nature. So, And by the way, Darwin also did say that males are intellectually superior to females. So he bears some responsibility for that as well. But th- this would be just one example of how secular definitions of masculinity over time have grown increasingly worse. And, you know, men live up to or down to what society expects of them. And so I wanted to help people to see, yeah, there is a secular script out there and it is negative. Mm-hmm. And it's, the problem is not masculinity. It's secularism that has weak, weakened men's commitment to a biblical concept of manhood. Yeah. You, you know, you really trace the development of men from being centered in duty to becoming, like you say, barbarians on the one hand, or on the other hand to, I think it's toothless dimwits on the other. And can you share some other key moments in that devolution? Yeah. So many people, when they try to understand where did the concept of masculinity come from, they'll say, well, what the 1960s, second wave feminism, No, no, no. You have to go much further back. Before the Industrial Revolution, men worked side by side with their wives and children all day on the family farm, the family industry, the family business. And the ethos for masculinity was very much a ethos. And like you said, duty. It's not even a Christian historian, but he says the colonial definition of masculine virtue was duty to God and man, quote unquote. So there was a very strong sense that masculinity was about duty and caretaking. How did we lose that? We lost it with the Industrial Revolution. It took work out of the home. And of course, men had to follow their work out of the home into factories and offices. And already in the 19th century, you start to see people protest that men were changing. They were no longer working alongside people they loved and had a moral bond with, they were working as individuals in competition with other men. And the literature of the day says men are becoming egocentric, self-interested, aggressive, greedy, acquisitive, look out for number one, get ahead at all costs. This is the language you start to see. So for the first time, the masculine nature was defined in negative terms. And so so on on the one hand, it, it is caused by this economic change and by the other, on the other hand, like I said, this also was the sort of the material conditions that caused secularism to spread because people began to say, well, we now have this public arena of factories and offices and financial institutions and, and universities and the state. And they said these large public institutions should run by scientific principles, by which they meant value free. In other words, don't bring your personal values, your private values into the public sphere, which is what we hear today still, of course. So as a result, the public square became increasingly, and since it was men getting that secular education and working in the secular sphere, a big part of how a biblical ethic and a biblical ideal of manhood was losing its hold on men's hearts. And you see that in the literature as well. 
people began to complain that men were not attending churches often. Men were not living out the biblical ethic as much. They were they were starting to make an idol out of their career, for example. That's one of the things you see frequently in the literature of the day. Men are starting to make a financial success their idol. So you can see there's, there's a very long history on how we lost, like you said, the, the idea of duty, duty to God and man being the masculine ethic. And it was because of the secularization of American society. So would you say that the biblical masculinity is a genuine masculinity? And and then how would you describe that? What is the genuine masculinity? Yeah. What, one thing that's interesting about the book, and that's a bit unique, is I don't just sermonize or moralize. What I did is I did I pulled together studies from psychologists and soci- sociologists on what Christian men actually do. Because, you know, I'm an apologist at heart, right? I like to I like to show why the secular world is wrong and why Christianity is true. And so one of the things I wanted to focus on was the secular world says that Christian men, because they believe in some form of male headship in the home, that turns them into bearing oppressive, oppressive, I said, oppressive, banical patriarchs, right? That's, that is the common media stereotype today. And so what I did is I pulled up studies on Christian men. And said, are they? <laughs> Do they? In fact, does, does believing in some form of male headship turn them into these overbearing, oppressive people? And the answer is no. When you actually look at the data from the social sciences, Christian men who actually believe it, live it, go to church regularly, attest out as the most loving husbands and fathers. And by the way, they do interview the wives separately, which is important. So they're really saying the wives report the highest level of happiness with their husband's expressions of love and affection. Evangelical fathers. And by the way, this... I. Most of the studies were done on evangelical Protestants because that's numerically the most, the highest number. But I I out evangelical Catholics as well, because it's the evangelical side not that that matters, right? It's people who actually believe the Bible, follow it, and live it out. They they are the most engaged with their children, in terms of both shared activities and in terms of things like like going to church together, taking the kid to a youth group. Also, in terms of discipline, like setting limits on screen time enforcing bedtime. Evangelical husbands, uh, couples have the lowest rate of divorce. And the real surprise is they have the lowest rate of domestic abuse and violence of any major group in America. So the media narrative is completely wrong. And when I looked at studies that actually quoted these husbands, by the way, I thought this was interesting. The most widely quoted Bible verse, you asked me what's biblical manhood look like. They all quoted Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. When I researched abusive abusive couples, some of them said they never even heard a sermon on Ephesians 5. Mm. But when you looked at the studies of the really committed Christians, invariably, they quoted Ephesians 5. So that tells you something about, you know, they're aware of what the scripture teaches and they're really trying to live it out. Yeah. So I, I want to ask another question about E5 because I'm pretty sure that that's also where the call to wives to obey your husbands or some translations submit to your husbands, where that comes from. And and people, I just had a conversation the other day with a friend and she said, look, you shouldn't take that. You shouldn't take that literally. I'm afraid you shouldn't tell people about that verse. I'm afraid that they're going to use that to justify abusive dynamics in relationships. So that's so interesting that what you're saying is that that's actually not the case at all. That's, that's quite the opposite. But can you speak a little bit to that verse and and, and you just, what you just said about headship, male headship in marriage? I think that this is a really important piece uh, that we should uh, touch on here. Yeah, it is important that the word is not obey because it's a different word uh, when Paul addresses children and says obey your parents. When it addresses slaves and servants, you know, it says obey. So submit is actually a different verb. So mm-hmm. it doesn't mean obey the way a child obeys. So, but it was so fascinating once again to actually read the studies done of these couples. And again and again, they said things like, what you know, submit does not mean you have no identity. It does not mean you have no choice and no voice. In fact, submitting means if they looked at some of the ways submit is used in other contexts. When a I'm I'm an academic, right? So sometimes when we write a paper, 
we will we will make an argument and we will say i submit to you that and then we'll give the argument or uh, a lawyer will submit a brief mm -hmm. right there are various ways that we use the word submit that just means i offer up to you my best thinking for your consideration use it if you can and so submit doesn't mean you're silent it means you offer up your best thinking your best experience your best judgment to help somebody else and so in many ways it, the person who just says oh it means shut up and be quiet that's not submitting because you're not offering your best <laughs> you're not offering your best to the other person if you're just silent so uh, there's a christian psychologist who i i quoted and he said you know the husband is told the well, both both partners, both spouses are told, bear one another's burdens, for example, right? And this psychologist said, how is your husband going to bear your burden if you don't even tell him what it is? You have to tell him. Otherwise, he can't obey God and bear your burden with you. Right. So, so it's fascinating when you actually read people who are living it out. They live it out in such a remarkably loving, respectful way. I, I have to tell you, I was blown away. I was surprised. I read the same media criticisms as everyone else. And I had my own father as a background as well. So I was blown away. I did not expect Christians to test out with such a loving and nurturing understanding of headship and submission. On, on headship, by, by the way, there was a meta-analysis done of you know, several different studies. And what they found is when Christian men were asked to define it, they, they did not usually define it in terms of breadwinning or in terms of final authority or in terms of breaker. They defined it in terms of spiritual leadership. That was the most common phrase, spiritual leadership. And when they were asked, well, what does that mean? Okay. They would say, well, first it starts with the obvious practical things. Get your family to church on Sunday, get your kids to youth group, lead family devotions, lead family prayer. But then it was also the less tangible things. They would say, well, you know, as a man, you're responsible for your wife and your children's spiritual growth and development. You're responsible for the health and life. You're, you're responsible for your kids, for example, helping them to stand against the temptations of a secular culture. So they also described it in the more uh, intangible ways. That it was just, again, I was blown away just reading their responses. So I, I include a lot of them in uh, the first two chapters of the, well, actually it's chapter two and three of the book. Yeah. So I'm hearing that and I'm wondering about men who have grown up because they're quite a few of them now who themselves did not have a father who either they didn't have a father who was totally absent um, from the home or they didn't have a father who could role model this, you know, biblical good masculinity for him because he was kind of taking after the culture. You know, what, what advice do you have for men who are struggling with that and trying to be though to exercise that headship to be those those fathers who maybe didn't have that example themselves. Yeah, you asked me earlier about the negative type of the tooth toothless dimwit, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of a funny phrase. But that's usually applied to fathers, right? It is fathers who are regularly ridiculed and mocked in the media. It's fathers who are treated as the buffoons, the butt of the joke. The kids are always smart. The wife is always smarter, but half the time the kids are smarter too. Where did that come from? Obviously, by the way, obviously it is demotivating a lot of men from becoming fathers. If they're not going to be respected for it, you know, it's not surprising that in the U.S. today, 40 percent of children live apart from their natural fathers. Many of them never see their fathers. It is the highest rate of single parenthood in the world. So we do have a lot of children and, and a lot of boys growing up without a good role model. But again, I want to, I want to pe people know that that we have uh, fathers of ridicule, they don't know why. You go back to the Industrial Revolution. When men were taken out of the home for the first time, they were not, they did not have close, warm, day-to-day -day relationships with their children. They began to be sort of out of touch with the family dynamics. They didn't really know what their children were thinking, what their children needed. And again, you see it already in the 19th century. People began to write that, hey, you know, fathers have become sort of irrelevant. You know, fathers don't really have a significant role in the family anymore. Or fathers have become incompetent because they don't know what their kids need anymore. All that language showed up already in the 19th century. And so what does that mean? The solution is this. I have a whole chapter. You, you know, you can't you can't uh, avoid giving some kind of solution. So I do have a very practical chapter on can we flex the workplace to give fathers time, more time with their children and 
And the, the pandemic had a small silver lining, which is that a lot of fathers found out they actually liked being home more. You know, if they could work part time, you know, maybe a hybrid situation, working at least part time from home. There was an article. I saw there's two surveys I saw. One survey found that 8% of fathers said they did not want to go back to the office full time after the pandemic ended. And then more recently, Harvard University did a study and they found that almost 70 percent, about the same number, about 70 percent of fathers said during the pandemic, this was actually the title of the article, during the pandemic, fathers got closer to their children and they don't want to lose that. And I thought, wonderful. Fathers are discovering, you know, having a better integration of work and home is actually more fun. They like being more involved with their children. By the way, you also have to co convince um, businessmen, though, too, you know, the corporations. Mm -hmm. So I do have some quotes from CEOs saying things like this was a direct quote. One CEO said we were afraid to let people work remotely because, you know, they were going to slough off. They were, they were not going to get their work done. And he said during that pandemic, that fear was completely exploded. We did not see any decrease in our productivity. And I have a quote from another CEO saying, you know, if you give fathers the time to be better fathers, they actually make better workers. You know, they're more motivated. They're happier. They're more they, they have a better feeling of uh, work work-life balance, their, their spin develop better skills. Here's how he put it. If you can negotiate with a three-year-old, you can certainly manage a group of adults. So, so Amen. we have to convince this, that it's a win-win. I knew, I figured you like that one. Yeah, I've anyway, spent it's a, it's a, a fair win -win. amount of time negotiating with my own three-year-old this morning. So, so this book yeah, I comes- I thought it was a clever- Yeah, it's a good one. This book comes as a follow-up to one of my all-time favorites, Love Thy Body, Answering Hard Questions About Life and Sexuality. In that book, you break down the two-story view of mind-body dualism that's really at the root of our society's confusion on gender, abortion, promiscuity, you name it. It's, it's so foundational. It's really the key to unlocking the culture wars we are experiencing, and, and you break that down beautifully in that book. And you also do a little bit of that in this book as well. So could you explain the two-story view and how it affects our view of the body? Yeah, um, I, I was reading a review. There was a review of Love Thy Body that I had not seen, and it, sh it showed up. And and he was, and the author was saying, you know, Nancy Pierce, you breaks down the body person dualism. And I, I, felt, I felt like the one thing he missed was this was not my idea. I am analyzing how secular people argue. So, for example, on abortion, Peter Singer, who is you know at Princeton, who wrote a book called Practical Ethics in 1980, and it's been a textbook ever since. So it's had an enormous amount of influence. And he says the the fetus is human from from day one, from conception. Most people don't realize this, but Secular bioethicists, professional ones, agree that life begins at conception. So, and and my I, I teach it in my class, by the way, and my students are, oh wow, this is great. This guy agrees life begins at conception, and they think he's on our side at first. But then he says the fetus is human, but not a person. And it turns out he's making this huge shift because you know when you and I talk about a person or human, we kind of mean the same thing. But he's made a very careful distinction where he says you uh, the fetus can be human. You know, it's it's part of the human race. It's got human genes and chromosomes, but it's not a per. And by personhood, he means someone with a certain level of cognitive functioning, a certain level of self awareness, ability to plan for the future. That's one of his criteria. And so, ever since then, people have used that body person dualism first of all to justify abortion. That's where it started: defeat a human, but not a person. And so, you can kill it at any time for any reason, because being human does not give it any moral status, does not warrant legal protection. So as long as it's merely human, in quotation marks, merely human, then it can be killed for any reason or no reason. It can be tinkered with genetically. It can be picked through for sellable body parts, Planned Parenthood does, and then tossed out with the medical waste, which is how medical journals describe the fetus, medical waste. So then that same thinking, that same body person dualism ends up affecting all of these other moral issues. And I'll just, I'll jump ahead to transgenderism because number one, it's what's really exploding today. And then number two, it's mo the most obvious. 
because gender transgender activists argue explicitly that your gender identity has nothing to do with your biological sex, with your body. You know, it's an internal feeling that has nothing to do with your body. So the BBC put out a documentary in which the narrator said, at the heart of the debate is the idea that your mind can be at war with your body, at war with your body, not just distinct, not just separate, but in conflict with one another. The BBC put out a, another video for, for teenagers where it featured a, a young girl who identified as non-binary. And what she said was, it doesn't matter. This is a direct, a direct quote. It doesn't matter what meat skeleton you've been born in. It's what you feel that defines you. So your body has been demoted to a meat skeleton that's not the authentic self. And all that counts is your feelings. Or if you saw, uh, uh, it was the Washington Post uh, had an article. And this one's not in the book because it's more recent. But it highlighted a curriculum for first graders first graders. And in, in this curriculum, teachers were told to tell first graders, you might be a boy, even if you have what some people might call girl parts, not even girl parts, but what some people might call girl parts. And of course, you might be a girl, even if you have what some people might call boy parts. So all the way down to first grade, young children are being taught your body is not part of who you are. Your body does not give you any clue to your identity. Your body parts are purely random, arbitrary. There was, an, I'll, I'll give you one more example, because this was in the news. And I, my memory is she was either first grade or kindergarten, maybe first grade. Anyway, she came home. She came home from school and she said, Mommy, my teacher said, just because you have girl parts doesn't mean you're a girl. And she said, please take me to a doctor so we can find out what I am. And the mother, it was in the news because the parents were taking the school to court for emotional distress. But that's what kids all the way down to first grade are now coming home saying, what am I, mommy? What am I? Because my body doesn't tell me who I am. And so it's causing incredible distress all the way down to kindergarten. Oh, and toddlers. Did you see Blue's Clues? For Pride Month, Blue's Clues, I, I have a slide of it. And my, I, when I show it to my students, they all crack up because they were all raised on Blue's Clues. And they had a Pride Month parade you know, essentially saying your body gives no clues to your identity. So, so you see the, the body person dualism ends up informing the secular view on virtually all of these moral issues. Yeah. So I think it, it might be pretty apparent to many of us, but because we do need to answer this, why does it matter that we are born particularly male or female? You denigrate the body. You are denigrating a key part of our, who we are. And see, my argument against the the two the two story dualism, you know, the body separate from the person, is that it denigrates the body. Notice that in all cases, it's the body being denigrated. Whether it's abortion, which says, "Oh, well, you're physically human, you're biologically human, but so what? You know, why should we give the fetus any legal protection?" Or if it's a gender activist who says, "Who cares about your body?" In fact, there was one transgender activism site that I was looking at once, and it said. The term biological sex is a hate term. So you can't even say biological sex without being accused of a hate term. So first of all, I think it's very important because God made the body. It's amazing because in the past, Christians were often said to be otherworldly. Like, we don't care about this world. We only care about the next world, right? We only care about heaven. We only care about the spiritual realm. Actually, right now, it's the secular world that denigrates the physical realm. And it's Christianity that says, no, the body has great dignity. The body has, has great value because it's made by a loving God. God intended to make us a, a, a material world, you know, all the way back to the early church. The early church had to make this case because the early church faced isms, you know, philosophies like Gnosticism. And a lot of people know Gnosticism because some of the New Testament books were written against Gnosticism. Platonism, well, we all know the name Plato. Manichaeism, St. Augustine was a Manichae for a while. Anyway, all of these isms denigrated the, the material world and said that the goal of salvation was to escape from the material world into a spiritual realm. And in this, in fact, they even argued, that the Gnostics argued that there were several levels of deity and that it was the lowest deity who was actually an evil god who created this world because this world is evil. So it must have been created by an evil god. And in this context, Christianity was nothing short of revolutionary because it said 
the the universe was not created by an evil god it was created by the supreme deity who's a good god and he created it good you know it was intrinsically inherently good and then the incarnation not only did god create this world but he entered into this world right he took on a, a physical body at that time this was actually christianity's greatest scandal you know the idea that the deity would enter into the physical realm and then of course when jesus was executed on a roman cross he did he escaped the physical world we, we might say as the gnostics taught we should aspire to do but what did he do then he came back in a physical body from the time of the apostles creed we have affirmed the resurrection of the body and so the resurrection is the ultimate affirmation of the dignity of the human body and then of course at the end of time god's not going to scrap this world as if he made a mistake the first time around no he's going to restore and renew it and create a new heavens and a new earth so christianity has an incredibly high view of the material realm i have to tell you there is no other religion or philosophy that has such a high view of the dignity and value and significance of the physical world and so that's good news I mean, that's part of why Christianity is good news, right? I mean, we usually use that word for the gospel, but this is good news too, because it's saying to the secular world, you know, you have great value and dignity, including your body. So I think that's that's one reason we should emphasize it, because it's 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 a connecting, you know, it's a connecting point with secular people where we can help them to see that Christianity gives them dignity like no other religion or philosophy does. Yeah, I always find it puzzling that it's called gender affirmation when what they're doing is the exact opposite of affirming that person's sex or gender. It's denigrating, like you say, what the knowledge, the wisdom that comes to us from the body about our call from God. So there's a common debate in Catholic circles, and I'd love to know your thoughts. Can feminism be redeemed, or do we need to be working with an entirely separate paradigm altogether? That's a good question. So because my father was abusive. Of course, what I did is I rebounded off into feminism for many years. I read all of the major feminist writers. You know, I thought uh, I thought each one is better than the one before. I always had some feminist book on my bedside table. So I'm speaking as somebody who's, you know, I was deeply involved in, in feminism for a long time. And I, I and then feminist, like in the 1970s or so, f- feminists really got more and more connected to just abortion and lesbianism. I don't know if you remember that time, but more and more they they tended to be kind of focused on especially abortion. Well, they still are. And so so I don't know if you know this group. There's a group called pro-life feminists. And so I thought, okay, I'll go off I'll, I'll go to them. I'll be a pro-life feminist. <laughs> you know, it's sort of a halfway house, right? Because because oh by that time I had become a Christian and it took several years, but I had also become pro-life. And it turned out that the local chapter leader of the pro-life of pro-life feminism group lived d- down the block from me. So I just walked over there and joined pro-life feminism. And then I I finally gave up the word feminism. And I'll tell you, I, I remember exactly when. So like I said, I was always reading some feminist book. And I was reading Nancy Friday's book, which is titled My Mother, Myself. And in that book, it's all about how our mothers messed us up, right? <laughs> if, you, if you had this problem, it's because your mother did X. And if you had this problem, it's because your mother did Y. And eventually I just put the book down and said, I'm tired of being a victim. She doesn't have any answers. She just portrays women as constantly victims. And I'm tired of being a victim. So that's when I stopped using the word feminist to describe myself. Mm -hmm. Now, the bigger picture is, can we can we redeem feminism at all? I I think it's perfectly possible to say yes. Yes, that of course, feminist feminism has had some good impact. And I do have some friends who are trying to recover the first wave feminists, right? The first wave feminists were were very pro-life, as you probably know. So some some people are trying to say, well, we're we're the real feminists because we're going back to the early feminists who were pro-life and who who cared very much about the family, and 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 they did not their solution to maybe having uh, babies that were not well planned was not to abort the baby. It was to inf- enforce male chastity. That was their theme, male chastity. So I think we would agree with the early feminists. 
But unfortunately, that's not what the term means anymore. So personally, I tend to say, yes, we can say it's done some good things, but I wouldn't use the term. I don't call myself a feminist anymore. I do not think, it's partly personal opinion. I, I realize this is sort of a judgment call, how much of it can be redeemed. I personally would not use the term anymore because I think it communicates something that I don't want to communicate, which is, well, very strongly pro-abortion. I, I think that's almost become the central issue for many feminists today, at least, you know, who are out in the public, out in the in the uh, political spheres, that tends to be their overriding concern. And so I think if you call yourself a feminist, you are likely to be misunderstood. And I'd rather not misunderstood, though mm-hmm. I don't use the term anymore. Right. It does take sort of a paragraph of explanation to uh, <laughs> say what one means when one says feminist these days. So how does Christian worldview reconcile the animosity that comes up between the sexes? Well, t- two things. One thing I found that I had to do in the book was people say, people would ask me, well, what do you think are the differences between the sexes then? And so you have to say that right up front. You have to say, yes, there are differences. Start with biology. Start with what's you know, scientifically, empirically knowable. Men are bigger, stronger, faster because of testosterone, they tend to be more aggressive, more risk-taking. In fact, let, let me give you a, excuse me, an anthropological study. This was an anthropologist who did the first ever cross-cultural study of concepts of masculinity. And he found that no matter how they defined masculinity, because you know some cultures were more warlike, some were more peaceful, but he found that they all shared the expectation that a man does what he calls the three Ps, provide, protect, and procreate meaning become a parent, you know, build into the next generation. And this is universal. You, you know, these are, most of these were not nations with a Christian background. They just are made, in, men are made in God's image. And they do understand that their unique strengths, their unique masculine strengths were not given them to just get whatever they want. It, they were given them to provide and protect and take care of the people that they love. And that seems to be Universal as like an innate, inherent knowledge. We might use the, the theological term general revelation. That means what people know without the, you know, even if they don't have the Bible, they know a lot of truths, right? Natural law. So I, I would say that what he discovered, what this anthropologist discovered is a kind of natural law that men everywhere do know what it means to be a good man and to use their strengths to serve those that they love. But, and then the other side of it is, of course, whenever you say there are differences between men and women or any group, typically one group is denigrated as less than. And so that's why so many feminists are afraid to admit any differences because historically, as soon as you admit the differences, women are defined as less than. So we do have to be very careful that when we talk about the differences, what is it that's unique to women you know, as women is that they, they have kids, they have babies. And we should frame that in a very positive way, that being being able to bring new life into the world is a good thing. And it has a very good impact on women's whole psychology. For one thing, they get a lot of oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone that makes them loving and nurturing. And that's a good thing. But also just taking care of an infant, right? Until they get to be about a year old, when an infant is in distress, you don't scold them. You don't reason with them. You alleviate their distress, no matter what you wanted to be doing right then. You stop what you're doing and you go help the infant. You take care of them. If it's three o'clock in the morning, you know, it, it builds up an incredible patience and and sensitivity. Oh, and the ability to read nonverbal cues because the kid isn't talking yet. So there's all kinds of ways in which the things that are distinctive to women as women are strengths not weaknesses. So every time we talk about the differences between men and women, we have to be very careful, I think, to to uh, describe the women's distinctives as also strengths, not not weaknesses, strengths of character. So, so I think you ask, how do we overcome some of the hostility? Well, first of all, by giving them both positive descriptions and, and urging them to respect one another's gifts. You know, in, in First Peter, Peter tells the husbands to respect their wives as co-heirs with them of the gracious grace uh, gift of life. You know, Peter tells husbands to respect their wives. And it's in the same context where he says, yeah, I know they're weaker vessels. But what he means by that is that politically, socially, economically, women have less power. And even physically, women have less power. 
And that's true. He's not saying they're weaker intelli- in, in intelligence or they're weaker in character. He is saying they're, they're more vulnerable in terms of social economic power. Just like in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, God's people are constantly told to take care of the widow and the orphan. Why? That's not a judgment on their character. It's because they have less power. So when Peter says women are weaker, he means they have less power. And men who have more power then are responsible for using their power for good. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Is there anything we haven't already discussed that you think listeners should know? Well, if you want to know where to buy the book. My next question. <laughs> of course, Amazon. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, if, if you were going to ask that anyway, let me tell you about one more study. Because one of the things that's uh, unique about my book is unlike most Christian books on the subject, I use a lot of studies and a lot of data. It's the most data-driven book that I've that I've written. And so this is another study that I found really, really helpful. This was, the, like I said earlier, the most controversial book I've ever written. And so I found that this study helped sort of over that initial hostility people have, like, whose side is she on? And so the, this was a sociologist who did a study. He's not a Christian, but he's well known in his field. So he gets invited to speak all around the world. And he came up with this clever experiment where he would young, ask young men two questions. He'd say, what does it mean to be a good man? If you're at a funeral and in the eulogy, somebody says he was a good man, what does that mean? And he said, the sociologist said, all around the world, young men had no trouble answering that. They would immediately say, duty, honor, integrity, sacrifice, do the right thing, be a protector, be a provider, be generous, be responsible. And he'd say, where'd you learn that? And the young men would say, I don't know. It's just in the air we breathe. Although if they were in a Western country, they would often say it's our Judeo-Christian heritage. So then he would ask a second question. He would say, well, what does it mean if I say, man up, be a real man? And the young men would say, no, 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 that's that's completely different. They would say that means be tough, be strong, never show weakness, play play through pain, be, be competitive, get rich, get laid. I'm using their language. And the sociologist concluded that men are, in fact, being pressured between these two conflicting scripts. Again, we would say, just like with the other study, men do know what it means to be a good man. I think that, to me, that was incredibly encouraging. Men do have this inherent, innate knowledge. Romans 2, right? We all have a conscience, Paul tells us. So men do have an intrinsic knowledge of what it means to be the good man. But they're feeling social pressure, cultural pressure to be the real man, quote unquote, which can slide into being more toxic. Those are the traits, especially if it's disconnected from the moral ideal of the good man. It can become dominance, entitlement, control, and so on. And so what this does, it, I, I draw two conclusions. One is it gives us a much better way for dealing with these issues. You know, men don't respond well to being called toxic, right? right? Nobody does. So in, instead of that, it'd be much more effective if you can tap into their inherent innate knowledge of what it means to be the good man, that they know and they want to be. And there is some, you know, they're made in God's image. So they do have that sense of, yeah, yeah, I do want to be a good man. And secondly, it means that when we ask men to live up to the biblical standard, we're not imposing something alien on them. Mm -hmm. This is their true nature. This is the way God actually designed men to be. And so it can sometimes come across, if you're talking to a secular person, they will treat the Christian ethic as somehow, you know, I'm not like that. You're, you're asking me not to be a real man. <laughs> Actually, the Christian ethic fits with who they are, the, the good man and who mm-hmm. they are. So I think that gives us a really good opportunity to, you know, to, to have a good apologetic, so to speak, for the Christian ethic and the Christian view of manhood. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. So where can listeners find your work and get copies of your books? Right. So of course, Amazon, like anything else, you can buy it on Amazon and, or if you prefer places like christianbook.com. And also my, my publisher helped design a new website for me. So come on over to Nancy Pierce. Pierce is with an E-Y, P-E-A-R-C-E-Y, nancypierce.com. And you can you can browse my other books. You can browse the one that you mentioned earlier, Love Thy Body, and take a look at yeah, take a look at what else I've written. Leave a message. There's a little spot for you to leave a message, and and that's kind of fun. I get to hear from my readers that way. So come yeah. on over and say hello. Fantastic. Yes, we will we'll put all of those links in the show notes so that listeners can find those. 
easily. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate your time and your willingness to be that salt and light in the world. God bless. Thank you so much.